So for most music lovers, I think, their first earliest, happiest musical memories are somehow associated with Tchaikovsky. I think, think back to your childhood, um, uh, think about Sugar Plum Fairy, think about uh, Little Dancing Swans, right? For us as musicians, for many of us, our earliest, happiest musical memories are also Tchaikovsky related. For me, it was the old French song. Um, it made me want to be a pianist when I was a little girl. I loved it just that much. Well, with all of that Tchaikovskying around, it turns out that we know very little about the man and very little about the music. Growing up in the Soviet Union, I was, of course, surrounded with pictures and statues of the great man. I mean, they even named a competition after him, right? Um, but unfortunately, all the actual details about him were being hidden and kept in archives by the Soviet government. When the Soviet Union fell, thank God, um, the Tchaikovsky's letters um, were released and started to be published, and they were shocking, to put, the, to put it very mildly. There's a reason they were being kept secret. They were published in English, so all of you can read them too, eventually. So I read them in Russian when they first came out, and my first shock was the man's extreme anti-Semitism. I mean, it was virulent, it was disgusting, and it made no sense because he was lifelong friends with so many Jewish musicians. So that was interesting. Um, another thing that we discovered, or rather had confirmed, um, through his letters, is that Tchaikovsky was homosexual. This was kind of suspected, and obviously not a shock to us, and probably not ex an extreme shock to his contemporaries. It was a shock to the Soviet government, but, uh, but Tchaikovsky's contemporaries were fairly ex uh, accepting. Um, it was sort of a live and let live attitude. And we found out about a lot of Tchaikovsky's lovers. So there were um, you know, handsome young men, um, they were artists, they were musicians, they were people from his, his social strata. Um, but what we also found out is that he was extremely promiscuous. I, I mean, extremely so. There would be uh, discussions of random strangers that he just met, servants, prostitutes, boy prostitutes, a lot of boy prostitutes. And this is where things become more complicated because we do not know what happened to these lost souls. But sometimes the interest in young boys was also um, boys from middle-class families, and therein things became very complicated indeed. One of these boys, Eduard Zak, um, who became the inspiration for Romeo and Juliet Overture, that glorious music, committed suicide after his relationship. Um, next time you listen to this glorious music, you might, you might think about what brought that on. Tchaikovsky was absolutely devastated by that suicide, and uh, he decided that things must change. So he wrote a letter to uh, his brother Modeste. And so, get married he did, uh, to Antonina Milukova, a lovely young woman, his student who adored him, an innocent, who did not understand what her role was to be. So the marriage went extremely badly from day one. So badly, in fact, that Tchaikovsky ran off to Italy um, to kind of recuperate and get his life back together. And it was while he was in Italy that he came up with the idea of writing a group of pieces for children modeled on Schumann's children's album. The need was great, as it is now. So much literature um, written for children, as it is now even, is not just simple, but simplistic. 
Uh, it has maybe broken chords in the left hand or Alberti bass. It is not interesting. It does not really make the child fall in love with music and it does not develop good taste. So Tchaikovsky's contribution was really quite necessary. Now, Schumann, of course, uh, you know, is the father of 10 and knew what he was talking about. And Tchaikovsky, you know, not so much. But, but Tchaikovsky did know children. He spent a lot of time with his sister's family in the country and enjoyed playing with this growing brood of uh, nieces and nephews, especially nephews, especially one nephew, the younger one, Lev uh, Davidov, known to his family as Bob, with, with whom he had a very, very long uh, relationship. We can hope sincerely that um, although the children's album is dedicated to Bob, it was only as an adoring uncle dedicating it to a favorite nephew and that the sexual relationship had not yet started as the child was about nine years old. But we know it, it didn't start much later than that. Uh, unusually for relationships like that, it went on for decades and became very passionate. Uh, I have there just one example of the sort of gorgeous love letters they wrote to each other. I mean, really, really something. Um, and they depended on each other emotionally, and Tchaikovsky even made Bob his executor. And if you think, though, that I'm leading to a happy end here, you would be wrong, because Bob became a um, drug addict and committed suicide. Mm -hmm. So that's suicide number two that we know of. There may have been many more. So, somehow, out of all of this pain, passion, desperation, guilt, shame, came out this incredibly beautiful music. So now let's talk about the children's album. So most of us have never even heard the entire album, much less played it. There are interesting things to talk about. Tchaikovsky, um, uh, Tchaikovsky's manuscript has the pieces in a specific order. The very first edition by Jurgensen changes the order. It's very interesting to know why and what for. Some of the changes seem quite arbitrary, actually. They may have had to do with, you know, how the things fit on a page. But other changes uh, are very meaningful indeed, and we'll talk about each of them as we go. What's interesting about the album, you can see the whole album as a picture of a child's busy day. So the child wakes up in the morning, and then there are games and toys, and there's a dance class, and uh, the child learns about foreign lands and people, and about folk situation around him, the, people, the common people, and then uh, the, um, uh, they go back to bed, and the nurse tell them, tells them uh, stories, and finally the night falls. And then there are pieces that don't make a lot of sense that we'll talk about but you can also see the album allegorically, and in fact, more meaningfully, as a picture of a man's life. So the first few pieces, the morning ones, are then the discovery of uh, spirituality, nature, and family. And then um, the person's discovery of the world around them and development of a social life, right? And then various complications arise, and the person discovers evil. And then there's a fascinating conclusion that, as I keep saying, but we'll talk about little by little. So what I would like to do is play the pieces in these groups. I will play them in the original order, which I think makes a great deal more sense. I'll play parts of the pieces. The album is very long. Some of the pieces are also very long. So let us start with the morning prayer. You will see that I list some of the pedagogical challenges um, uh, on each of these slides. So, morning prayer.
very rarely played, sadly. The next piece, Winter Morning, um, I find entirely fascinating. It's very difficult to pin down what the character is. It certainly isn't happy. I think it's picturing the sort of winter that Russians would be familiar with and that we are not unfamiliar with here in Chicago. There's something very cold about it. Not an easy piece either. to teach downups, to teach chords, to teach voicing. Then the following piece is Mama, and it's a picture of pure tenderness, probably the most Schumannesque of all the pieces in the way it is laid out. Um, having three things going simultaneously is not at all easy, is it? <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous and really quite a bit more difficult than it sounds because you have to keep that inner voice quiet. So, the next set of pieces is what I'm calling children at play. So games and toys. We're going to start with the boys. The first of the boys pieces is the famous little horseman which is a very difficult piece that teaches staccato. So I don't know about your students, but when my students see a staccato, if they see it at all, uh, their idea is to kind of slap the keys from as high as possible and hope for the best. That obviously doesn't work, and it certainly does not work in this piece. So very good opportunity. And I've seen it in various children's anthologies. So this one is better known, March of the Wooden Soldiers. It teaches the dotted rhythm. Another thing, I don't know about your students, but my students just can't. particularly difficult, except for the aforementioned that rhythms, of course. Now, now we switch to the girls. And as in all periods of life, where there are little girls, there will be drama, right? So, what I'm calling the saga of the doll. In the original manuscript version, we have three pieces in a specific order. There's a new doll, then there's a sick doll, you know, bits have been torn off, who knows? And then there is uh, the, the, the funeral march for the doll. I oh, know, it's very sad. And um, the, the, the publisher just wouldn't have any of that. 
So in the published version, we start with the sick doll and then we bury the, the doll, although some editions omit that. Um, and then after a decent period, with like the waltz in between, we get a new doll. Um, these are some of the easiest pieces actually in the set, these three. So uh, it, it's not a bad idea to even assign them as a set, like to tell the story in whichever order. I have heard from a friend who assigned them in the original order and there was much crying, so the order had to be changed. So it is what it is. Um, we have to remember that Tchaikovsky's time is before antibiotics, right? And before proper anesthesia for surgery. So children would have known somebody who died. So it, it was not, not a bad idea for them to experience uh, this, to work through their feelings through music. Right? And of course, the pieces are just gorgeous. So the new doll is one of the easiest ones, and it teaches, of course, balance between the hands and legato in one hand versus very light staccato in the other. difficult than it truly is, so we like that. And here we are with the sick doll. It, this one is really quite long, so I'll only play a little bit, but notice how few notes there are, and yet how much complexity there is. There are three lines, and you have to keep them separate in your mind, in your ear, and in your fingers. I choose to use really quite different articulation for each. can be even taught by road, but the complications are significant. And here we are. The doll is defunct. It has to be put to rest. So after working their way through that, hopefully eventually the child is ready for other funeral marches or funeral march-like. Um, so now on to happier things. The next grouping I'm calling the dance lesson, as all the children of um, middle class or above would be having them, as most social life of the period ha has to do with dancing. right? And as you would expect, from a composer of some of the most marvelous ballets in existence, these pieces are fabulous. We're going to start with the very famous waltz. I've seen that in various uh, children's uh, albums or uh, compilations as well. So that one is taught, but should be taught more. You'll notice that there are various moods here. We go from uh, kind of a sweet, gentle, intimate waltz to what Chopin would call Bas Brillant. I'll only play half of it or so because it is very long.
music, isn't it? And as you could hear, I am already using a lot of what I call the uh, appropriate waltz lilt, where the first beat is significantly longer and, and heavier than beats two and three, which is what makes it sound like a waltz as opposed to say a mazurka, right? Easy enough to do um, and important to teach. The next dance in this series is the polka. Um, one of these that is more difficult than it looks or sounds. for Chopin mazurkas. Notice all those little rests. You will see them in practically every Chopin mazurka and they're not easy to teach from sad personal experience. So better to do so on an easier piece than let's say, right? Oh, so mazurka. performed in this country at all. And this is where we go meet the common folks. So for Russians of Tchaikovsky's social class, um, the peasants were like a foreign, uh, absolutely foreign group. Most people don't know that in the Russian Empire, the um, uh, serfdom was only outlawed in 1861. Serfdom is in every way indistinguishable from slavery, where peasants belonged to the land, could be born, could be sold, you could do anything you wanted with them. Um, so they were really seen as different or separate. So middle class and upper people in Russia actually spoke French to each other. Um, Russian was to talk to your servants. Right? So Tchaikovsky, of course, is known as one of those composers who introduced Russian folk elements into Western music. Now, Russian folk elements were already introduced by Musushki and his ilk, right? At that, uh, but Tchaikovsky actually integrated them. He's famous for it. There he's saying that the reason he was able to do so is because he grew up in the country, like a wild boy. So he was familiar with, you know, the aforementioned peasants. You can read that. So to him, folk music is part of parcel of his own musical imagination. So there are three um, pieces in this set, and they are, each one of them, absolutely fascinating. So here's, here's the Russian song. Lots of fascinating things about it, I mean, harmonically for one, but also look at the phrase lengths. Well, I'll play it and then we can sort of discuss. measures. Or is it 4 plus 2? Or is it 2 plus 4? Or is it 3 plus 3? I don't know. You can decide case by case basis. But 
I, I think the piece is absolutely fascinating and has such an exotic flavor. It will be a lot of fun to play. The next one in the set um, is translated here as Farmer's Boy playing on the accordion. Ugh. That is not the Russian title at all. The Russian title uses um, the word muzhik, which is kind of a pejorative uh, term for a peasant. So it kind of means that this is somebody who's not very sophisticated, not particularly um, educated or at all, maybe it doesn't smell so good. In this particular case, he doesn't play the accordion so good either. He knows about three chords. Um, so the piece itself is hilarious. Tchaikovsky invents minimalism. <laughs> also, remember how we're all taught you're supposed to resolve your dissonances? But not so much, right? So the last of the folk set is Kamarinska, which is kind of a famous tune. Tchaikovsky didn't write it, he's just using it. Um, more of that wonderful finger staccato that Tchaikovsky keeps asking for. <laughs> This one has somewhat of a sordid history. Um, this is a tune that Tchaikovsky heard from yet another boy prostitute in Italy. Um, he talks about it rather a lot in his letters. Um, the, the, the tune is evocative for him and for us. Um, the piece itself is not particularly difficult as how the left hand is all formula. And if you can get past the dotted rhythms, the piece really is quite playable for you know, early intermediate player. developing good taste in children. You don't have to tell them the icky bits, right? Um, the next piece is my all-time favorite, the old French song. So it uses interesting, um, a, an interesting device, an old one called Fubourdon, which is uh, you know, that help note, a drone basically. This can be seen as a song of, say, a troubadour singing beneath, the, uh, beneath windows of a castle, or it can be perhaps uh, you know, a countess sitting there accompanying herself on the lute and singing a beautiful song. 
in the middle of the song, perhaps she remembers a dance that, uh, that she went to. You can come up with all kinds of beautiful pictures in your mind. I think it is probably the simplest piece in the album um, and kind of good to start with. Now we go on to Germany. This song is some combination of a landler, a drinking song, and a yodeling song. Our children are ignorant, they have no idea what yodeling is, so you can show them something on, um, on YouTube. So basically, if you have a piano that repeats, you have hope. If the piano will not repeat, you do not. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is what it is. So how to do them? So I think there are two basic ways to, to attempt repeating chords. One is to think about changing the position of your wrist for each chord. That works for some people. And um, for, for those for whom that doesn't work, you can think about kind of walking forward on the key. The effect is exactly the same. It just gets you off, off the key a little bit quicker. Uh, but I find that for about 70% of the people, one or the other method will work. But as I said, if the piano doesn't repeat, They're more like Brothers Grimm. Bad things happen, um, well, constantly. I mean, people get dismembered, burned, eaten, bleh, killed in creative ways, turned into little goats. That's one of my favorites. Um, it is probably good for children to work through their fears that way. 
But now we, uh, we cuddle our children way too much. You know, when my son was small, my entire family thought that I was a bad mother and didn't teach him enough Russian. So everybody gave me these beautiful illustrated books of Russian fairy tales to read him in Russian. So I took one look and said, no, a green eggs and ham it is. I, I'm so not reading all that horror. Um, so these, uh, the way Tchaikovsky describes these fairy tales, bad stuff happens. Um, a lot of the bad stuff happens, as you will find out to the pianist. These are some of the more difficult pieces here. So, um, this is a nursery tale, or better translated as the nurse's tale. I'll play a bit of it. It's really quite complicated. The, the way you have to work the double, uh, the double notes is truly uncomfortable. So this song is difficult, but the next one, Baba Yaga, I think it's the most difficult uh, work in the entire set. So Baba Yaga is um, the Russian witch. She flies around in a stoop, does bad stuff, and punishes bad children, right? So the most famous Baba Yaga, I think, is in Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. But this one is absolutely magnificent. But as I keep saying, this one is really hard. Really, really, really hard. as this one, thank heavens, does. Good piano, nice piano. Um, then you're completely out of luck. Tchaikovsky must have had an amazing instrument in Italy because so much of this is so difficult. Or, as I suspect, he wrote completely away from the instrument because so much of his music is so awkward. He seems to have a very fuzzy understanding of how many fingers people actually have, even for children's music, right? Okay, so then, um, now the kids are good and scared. Now the night falls and they can go to sleep. And the next piece in the cycle is, I think, the most famous one and certainly one of the loveliest. Um, Sweet Dreams, you probably all uh, played or taught it, so I, I don't know, maybe I should just play a little bit of it. requires really funky fingerings to keep things legato. I, do, I don't know if you saw it, but I do a lot of switching uh, on the same note because I want it to be legato and I only have five fingers I made. Problems. So the next piece of the night cycle is Song of the Lark. <laughs> <laughs> 
that is a very traditional Russian image. And the lark can be a bird, or a lark can represent the human soul. If so, I would like to know what actually happens to the bird or, or, or the soul at the end of the piece. So. because I don't know what else it can be. But it's fun. Uh, Tchaikovsky clearly loves this melody because he uses it in other places as well. So now we come to the most interesting and ambiguous part of the cycle. So whether we think of this as a child's day or a man's life, the last two pieces seem very out of place because like we're asleep now, now what? Right? But everything now depends on the order of these final pieces. So in Tchaikovsky's, um, in Tchaikovsky's manuscript, we have the choir sings in church first, followed by the mechanical organ or the hurdy-gurdy now. And then the first edition reverses the order. So we have to think of these pieces being very allegorical or symbolic in fact, right? So when we're in church, perhaps we're seeking redemption, absolution, hope, um, seeking really, not necessarily getting as you will hear. And then the hurdy-gurdy man, now that's an interesting thing. This is an image that we don't see anymore, but it was quite common in Tchaikovsky's time in Europe. So a, a hurdy-gurdy man is basically a mendicant, a, 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 you know, he's begging for alms, right? And he's playing this mechanical organ thing. The thing about the mechanical organ is the man is not making music. He is just a turning, a turning the handle. The music is preset, right? He has no way to change it. He is defined by this music. There is no hope for him at all. There's no change possible. So that, that means no absolution and no redemption is possible, right? I know, exactly. It, it, this is sad and dark. Um, and yet the music is, is really kind of amazing. So since we do have a little bit of time, I will play the complete song because uh, you tell me whether absolution exists.
I don't know. I don't feel particularly hopeful, do you? I know. So here we go, last piece in the cycle, the mechanical organ guy. This piece is often played with, to my, um, to my mind, extremely unnecessary amount of emotion. It's sentimental, but not full of sentiment. Remember, the music is preset, it's canned. It, it's just a mechanical thing. Decisive ending, right? And so I, I think there is no solution. Tchaikovsky came back to Russia and continued his life the same way, right? Nothing changed for him. And then in his early, at, at a very early age, there was this very suspicious death of his, um, supposedly from cholera, from drinking, you know, dirty water or something. Or there's plenty of suspicions that it was suicide, that it was assisted suicide, that it was very, very assisted suicide or required suicide, basically a judicial murder of some kind. Um, for what we don't necessarily know, but one suspects it was for, for some misbehavior in his personal life. And yet, at the end of all that, the music that he has left us is amazing and remarkable. And we should honor sort of the, the sacrifices that went into it by playing it, teaching it, enjoying it, and seeing the light in it. Um, so people ask me, like after learning all that about Tchaikovsky, how do you play his music? To which my response is saying in the human psyche where the genius somehow is paid for by some kind of personal darkness. 